Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and we challenge those coming up with the solutions. And we start today with a state of emergency that has been declared in the English Channel by fishing groups and charities. They say industrial practices are having a devastating impact on both ocean life and local businesses and severely depleting fish populations. Our science correspondent Thomas Moore reports now on the new battle in English waters. Eighteen miles off the Sussex coast, Operation Ocean Witness finds what it's looking for. We know their speed and we know their pool, so basically they are doing one on five knots, which is they're probably fishing. It's a French trawler using a fishing method that conservationists say is unsustainable because it is so highly efficient and Greenpeace wants to stop it. They're asking you to go home now. Yeah, that's fine. And when they say no? Greenpeace has been patrolling the channel for much of the summer. It says industrial scale trawling has severely depleted fish populations and is declared a state of emergency. This is what's called a fly shooter, one of around 75 boats operating in the channel. It not only drags heavy equipment along the sea bottom, but it also has a vast net that encircles whole shoals of fish. Fly shooting is legal. The trawler is within its rights. But research shows one vessel using the method catches as many fish as up to 11 smaller boats. And Greenpeace has joined coastal fishermen in calling for a ban. Local fishers along the south coast are in complete crisis. Like we've heard time and time again that there just simply isn't enough fish to catch. And they largely blame that on fly shooters, a kind of industrial fishing vessel that you see behind me. They, they sweep in, they can fish over a huge area extremely quickly. And then the local smaller fishing boats, they arrive and find that there's just nothing left. So they, they cannot compete with these kinds of vessels. Fisheries conservation scientists say there are quotas on how many fish can be caught in any one area, even with fly shooting. But it still has a huge impact on traditional communities. If you're a small-scale boat fishing out of a small harbour, you're hoping to go out every month and spread your catches over the year. Whereas these boats might come in and remove their entire catch for the year, possibly in the space of a month. And of course that then leaves a hole in the amount of fish there that's available to the small boats that remain behind. So it's an issue of equity. The French trawler lifted its nets when confronted by Greenpeace. Its owner didn't want to comment. The government said it was aware of the concerns over fishing pressures in the English Channel and it wants to work with the industry to tackle the issues. Thomas Moore, Sky News, of the Sussex coast. Well, in today's other climate news, there is a potentially damaging gap between climate reality and people's understanding of its catastrophic effect. That's according to new research. Despite 2021 being a year of devastating wildfires, floods, thawing permafrost, the Epson Climate Reality Barometer found that one in 11 Americans and almost 3 million Britons don't believe in the climate crisis at all. The report also found that 46% of the people asked were optimistic that we will be able to solve the climate crisis within our lifetime. Well, we will be discussing if we're taking the climate crisis seriously enough in our daily climate show debate. And tonight I'm going to be joined by Director of Cambridge Zero, Emily Schuckberg, and Chief Executive of the fully charged show, Dan Caesar. That'll be coming up for you in just a few minutes. The World Wildlife Fund has called on the government to ensure UK banks are not funding deforestation. The production of palm oil, soy, cocoa, timber and rubber encourage deforestation in some of the world's most diverse habitats. The charity says 300 UK-based financiers are directly providing £40 billion in funding to companies that are a threat to the future of the Brazilian and Indonesian rainforests. Now, the price of pasta could rise by as much as 50%. That's due to a shortage of a key ingredient following a disastrous season for farmers in North America. Durham wheat prices have increased almost 90% after a summer of extreme heat and droughts in Canada. 
And a zoo in Sydney has welcomed two baby bilbies. The endangered small rabbit-like marsupials are believed to have inhabited Australia for up to 15 million years but had become extinct in New South Wales. Zookeepers hope that the successful breeding programme at the Taronga Conservation Society means they will eventually be reintroduced into the wild. Now, just days after we learnt that Europe experienced its hottest summer on record, we found out today that the US has done exactly the same. The country's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration announced that the average temperature during the summer was 74 degrees Fahrenheit or 23.3 Celsius. Now, that is 2.6 Fahrenheit or 1.4 degrees Celsius above that long-term average. Well, you can see here this chart, the average summer temperatures in the United States from 1895 until now. And this rise here, that is the year of the so-called Dust Bowl summer of 1936, which before 2021 was the hottest on record. But this summer beat it tiny fraction, 0 0.01 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, Sean Sublett is a meteorologist with Climate Central, a non-profit climate science organisation, and he joins us from Richmond in Virginia. Sean, good to talk to you. It was particularly acute in the United States, in five states, wasn't it? In one corner uh, of, of the United States. Why was it particularly acute there? Yeah, Samantha, thank you very much for, for inviting me. Yeah, the weather pattern this particular season was very susceptible to heat in the American West. On any one particular summer, the jet stream pattern will govern how much above or below average the temperatures are going to be. So the jet stream pattern for most of the summer favored big time heat in the western part of North America. And as a result, not quite as hot uh, in the southeast and the south central part of the United States. But compounded upon that was a horrific drought that has been ongoing since the wintertime season, which is the time of the year they normally get their most rainfall in the western United States and across North America as well. So combined with the, the seasonal aspect of the, the ridging or, or abnormally warm areas uh, with the jet stream pattern in the Northwest and the Western US, with the ongoing drought, those two things feed upon themselves and really intensify the heat. And that's why we saw really the seat of the heat, if you will, across Western United States. We were making a comparison there, Sean, with the Dust Bowl summer back in 1936. How are the causes of what's going on now different from what they were then? Yeah, both were very man-made back in the 1930s. Farming practices were not as well established as they are today. So that led to massive amounts of dust from agricultural practices, which again, in turn, feeds back on the heat and dust just racing across the prairies of the South Central Plains and, and back to the front range of the Rockies. So that was also a human cause because of poor agricultural practices. Now, obviously, this is more of an atmospheric phenomenon with a large increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So we see the heating through a widespread part of the globe as well as here in the United States, not just focused in on the South Central Plains like it was in the 1930s. Fascinating talking to you. Sean Sublett, thank you very much. Thank you, Samantha. Now, mangroves are really important in helping mitigate against the effects of climate change, but they're being killed by its effects. The swamps help filter water, they provide important habitats, and they even store huge amounts of carbon. But they face numerous threats, from being cut down to rising sea levels and pollution from thousands of tonnes of rubbish. Now, one project in Brazil is trying to make a difference. Ao mesmo tempo eu me sinto feliz, né? Porque em si estou cuidando né, da natureza por meus netos, antecedentes, mais tarde poder ver. Cercando as áreas, limpando as áreas e progressivamente avançando com os plantios. Isso daqui é uma sentença de morte para os manguezais. Agora é intensificar o passo porque as mudanças climáticas vêm aí. E os manguezais são uma uh, das ferramentas para combater esse aquecimento. Ah. 
Ah, eu sinto orgulhoso, né? Fazer parte, né? De estar tá ajudando. Porque se cada um fizer a tua parte, eu acho que seria a mais, mais, coisa mais linda do, do mundo, né? Ver um mangue tão lindo assim, limpo. Well, do stay with us because coming up after the break, Emily Schuckberg from Cambridge Zero and Dan Caesar from the Fully Charged Show will be here to discuss if we're taking the climate crisis seriously enough. Good to see you both and whether indeed it's time we all stopped eating meat. Stay with us. I had left New York just a couple of days before the attacks and saw everything live on television like everybody else in Europe and uh, I was sort of traumatized by what I saw and the images invaded my dreams and I was really desperately trying to get to somehow get them out of my mind and I realized the only way for me would be to go there and see for myself but by then there were no photographers allowed anymore which was good and uh, there was only one photographer, Joel Mayerowitz, who was appointed the official photographer of the site by the mayor of New York at the time, Rudy Giuliani. I knew Joel and he said, oh, I understand your problem. Um, I can take an assistant every now and then. So if you come to New York, I take you on for a day as my assistant. So I flew and went with my big panoramic camera. Joel took me with, you, with him and we spent six hours together. After a while, he let me wander alone and, and I took in the place and tried to listen to the message that the place had. And then eventually, all of a sudden, something miraculous happened. And even Joel, who had spent weeks and weeks there, said, I've never seen this. Somehow the sun managed to shine into it via reflections on other skyscrapers around. It was like mirrors shining the light of the sun into this handhold. And all of a sudden, it had a very different message. It had a very peaceful and serene message of hope. At this moment, there were lots of crews just roaming through the, the debris, trying to find human remains or any objects. And it was all very quiet and silent work. And if anything was found by any of the crews, there was a siren going on. And then everybody on the site, these hundreds of workers, took their hats and helmets off and were in both their heads in silence. It was very, very amazing work and very dignified and serene atmosphere. It's estimated that around 70% of our coastlines are experiencing increased erosion. We start with a steel structure that we put into the seafloor. We then pass a, a very small electrical current between what we call an anode and the, and the cathode, and the structure itself is the cathode. that driving us to school creates extra toxic air at drop-off and pick-up times. Saturday will start mild for most, with a fair amount of cloud around and some rain for central parts of Scotland, also Northern Ireland. Much of that should clear away through the day and we'll see a few showers developing, but in essence it's going to be a fine day for many. A little bit cooler than it has been, temperatures in the mid to late teens and peaking at around 23 degrees Celsius, 73 degrees Fahrenheit. Rain reaches the southwest later in terms of air pollution. It's likely to be low right across the country. The Air Quality Report. Sponsored by Philips Air Purifiers.
Hello and welcome back to the Daily Climate Show on Sky News. We're getting straight to discussing the climate issues of the day with the director of Cambridge Zero and climate scientist Emily Schuckberg and chief executive of the fully charged show, Dan Caesar. Good to see both of you this evening. We were hearing earlier in the show about how researchers suggested that there could be a significant gap between people's perceptions of climate change and the severity of the climate emergency. So are we taking the climate crisis crisis seriously enough. Uh, Emily, let's come to you first. There's definitely been an improvement of awareness, hasn't there? But still a significant number of climate deniers in G7 countries. Uh, yes, which when we see the, the changes that are occurring around the world in terms of the extreme weather events that we that you that you highlighted earlier in the programme is, is quite shocking. Here in the UK, um, a recent survey showed that actually British adults do really um, appreciate the scale of the threat, the environmental threat threat, and, and rank it as being one of the top three issues facing the country today, above um, Brexit, immigration, crime, and other important um, uh, issues. Um, but uh, but nevertheless, it is the case that we, you know, there are still a significant number of people who don't appreciate the scale of, of the crisis that we're facing in terms of climate change. It also looked in terms of how people are feeling and looked in, ter in terms of uh, the level of optimism that people were feeling. We can see that uh, here, this quote, and how, how it easily can slip over into feeling uh, delusional about things. And when you read the IPCC report, Dan, that came out this summer, um, which suggested it could take millennia to repair the damage that we've done. Uh, is it right that people, the significant proportion of people, are optimistic that it, they can fix it in their lifetime? Well, I'm in the solutions industry, and even when I read that report, it, it made my kind of jaw uh, drop and, and realise the science of the challenge. But there are lots of things that, that we can do, and I remain actually very, very optimistic. The last year and a half, people have really, really started to take notice of this issue. It has changed and it is something that is being debated. There are some people who won't take notice for many years still to come, but we don't have to focus necessarily on them. We have focused on the people that we can win over. And there's lots of great new technologies that people can em employ to uh, lower their carbon emissions. Yeah, I mean, that's another interesting thing, isn't it, Emily? A lot of people that were surveyed said, yeah, I'm going to do this. But the number of people who actually did it was much lower. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, just to go back to your earlier, I'm a climate scientist, and um, so I spent time in the Arctic and the Al Antarctic, and I've seen the scale of the changes that are occurring there. And, you know, it's quite right that people are, are pessimistic. But at the same time, I'm also um, very much part of helping develop some of the solutions. And where, I, where I'm optimistic, it's in terms of the, the exciting innovations and creativity in terms of um, how we can generate solutions that actually have all sorts of other benefits as well. Um, benefits in terms of improving air quality, for example, going back to um, uh, just the start of this segment. Um, so I think, you know, pessimism and optimism is, is a mixture of the two. And Dan, from your perspective, what, what is the role of business, not just big business, but small business in all of this? Well, I think, I think business does have a big role to play. I think we need to cut to the chase now. The reality is that this problem has been around for a very long time. People are really interested in solutions, but don't necessarily know to, where to begin. So I think, for example, one of the things that, that I talk about a lot every day is, is electric cars. And uh, we believe that they are one of uh, the biggest solutions to uh, dealing with this problem, not the only one by any means. But things like businesses taking that seriously and having charging points outside their, their, their properties is, is a good start. So businesses can play a huge role by accepting the reality of what's going on and actually uh, leading from the front. And employees will uh, take comfort in that and will follow their lead. All right. So lots for us to work with there, but still some room uh, to improve. And with meat and dairy accounting for nearly 15 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions, we're often told that going vegetarian or indeed vegan can help to significantly reduce your carbon footprint. And with now politicians in the Netherlands considering plans to cut livestock numbers by almost a third in order to reduce emissions. Is it time to stop eating meat? I suppose I could put you up both on the spot here, Emily. I mean, are are you a vegan vegetarian? Should we be? I'm not a vegan vegetarian, but I do eat an awful lot less meat than I once did. And, and I think that's, you know, that's the most important thing. It's about moderation. Um, the other thing that's really critically important is 
just wasting less food. The amount of food waste is really shocking. Um, it's estimated that some twenty billion pounds worth of food waste is produced in the UK each year, and an awful lot, a lot of that is edible food that's just being thrown away. Um, something like twenty million slices of bread um, that could be eaten put in the bin each year. It's complete waste, and the emissions associated with that are all the way from the emissions associated with growing that food in the first place, processing it, packaging it. It, transporting it, as well as then what happens when it's thrown away and potentially sent to landfill. So there's an awful lot that can be done additional to looking at your diet um, just to reduce the amount that we're wasting. Yeah, informing your choice is so important, isn't it? And when you're looking at some of the alternatives that you can pursue, it's important to know as well about the provenance of those alternatives. And you look at the simple fact here about avocados and you realise actually you think you're doing a virtuous thing, but there's a lot of water that goes into the production of avocados. How do people inform their choices, Dan? Well, that's that's really really difficult. I mean, I would echo Emily really. So, uh, getting rid of you know meat and fish intake entirely is quite difficult. Uh, reducing it um, significantly is actually easy enough. I found it easy enough. But it's not just about going you know, cold turkey. Excuse the pun. You know, there's actually going to be a very large uh, plant based meat market, uh, possibly worth by thirty five billion by twenty twenty seven, according to uh, Unilever. And, you know, veganism and vegetarianism is, is on the rise uh, around the world. Um, but as I say, you don't have to completely go uh, meat free or, or fish free. It has to be a choice and people have to want to do it. At the end of the day, though, locally sourced seasonal fruit and veg remains the, you know, the best the best option on the table. Yeah. And what do you think about this proposal in the Netherlands, Emily, to force farmers to cut down on the number of livestock? Is it, Do we need radical solutions? Actually, I think the critical thing is to work with farmers um, to look at how they can reduce their emissions. And that's something that we've been doing um, locally in around Cambridge, working with the farmers to see how they can alter their farming practices in a way that has a dramatically less impact um, on the environment. And actually, it ends up being beneficial for the farming processes themselves as well in many instances. Yeah. And do you agree with that just briefly, Dan? Yeah, I, I think you have to take people on, on the journey. I don't think people will do, as we've seen over the last, you know, whatever period of time, people don't necessarily want to be forced to do things. But the Dutch are pretty progressive. The Netherlands is pretty progressive about things like uh, gas boilers as well and not having them uh, okay. installed. But you've got to socialise that uh, with, with the market and having, you know, living in a low, low-lying low land with a dike potentially at the end of your garden really focuses okay. on Okay, I'm sorry to jump in there and cut you off, but we are out of time, unfortunately. Emily Schickberg and Dan Caesar, thank you very much for your time this evening.